the conditions you're living in are terrible. Maybe you don't have a living room. Maybe you are like huffing mold and being told that it's your own fault because you dry your clothes in the house. And you feel like you have no agency to have a stake in your community because you have to move all the time. All of these things like affect every element of it. And then even home ownership is not promised. Home ownership, even once it's acquired, through the lens of this luxury commodity does not grant us a stability when we live in a country who are experiencing the most egregious wage freezes since the Napoleonic Wars. We are in a crisis of our labour market. To talk about that separately from housing is crazy. Hello, Kieran. Hi. Thank you for coming on Joe today. We're going to be talking about the housing crisis today because you've written a book called All the Houses I've Ever Lived In. And well, we're in a housing emergency. I think that's that's my big takeaway of the book. Is that why you wrote it? Yeah. And I, I kind of also wrote it as a way to expand the conversation kind of beyond, you know, the need for, say, house building, even though that is an important need. It was really to try and knit together the fact that, you know, the housing emergency is a public health emergency. It's an emergency about access to green space. It is connected to workers' rights and wage freezes and... You know, all of these things kind of coalesce together. And I think that it's a really good way of thinking about, you know, how we live and a way to avoid seeing ourselves as like separate interest groups uh, and say, well, you know, obviously, if I'm talking about my home, this has an impact on my neighbourhood and my locale. Mm. When you say public health emergency, like I immediately think of Quay Joe and all of the work that he's been doing over the past couple of years mm -hmm. and just putting to the the forefront like all these viral videos of people's homes full of black mold full of damp just like absolutely soaking like with water and the council refusing to do anything about it which I think has shocked so many people like most of the country who live in well homes that aren't like that mm -hmm. but I guess you kind of touch on that a little bit when you talk at the beginning of the book about living on Green Man Lane mm -hmm. and that's a, an estate that you loved growing up in mm -hmm. and is now dilapidated and hasn't been um, kept up. There's been no repairs done to it. And it's just basically been left to rot. I, I feel bad saying that because it's like your home. But is mm. that what it is? Yeah, I mean, I think it speaks to, you know, what we've seen in our cultural history and and subsequently our political history about the ways in which council estates have just been left as sites of derision and neglect. and they've And they've been seen through that lens by the media and certainly by, you know, successive governments and I think that lots of people who are living in social housing understand how neglected they are by the state and of course there's high profile examples like the fire at Grenfell Tower but there have been examples for the last 10, 20, 30 years of tenants living in various states of disrepair which is everything from damp and mould to structural disrepair and simply like being ignored you know just having you know, creating coalitions with tenants, residents associations and saying, OK, we can push back. You know, we can work with activists, we can work with local journalists and still that leading to nothing. Mm. And so I think that it's harder and harder to advocate for, you know, your own health when you when you exist in some of these spaces, because now, of course, tenants don't have access to legal aid when they're trying to access disrepair claims. And so all of these barriers just create this like, yeah, huge public health emergency that people are living under every day and that begins at council estates usually but of course we know that this has an impact for everybody yeah I, I think it's more I suppose a lot more a lot more people have been kind of brought into this sphere of having unstable housing especially in the last couple of decades I mean this is a housing emergency that hasn't existed for the last two years it's been going on for what 20 25 years right really when you, you know, I have to say, I selfishly didn't read your chapter on Grenfell. I actually skipped over it. Right. It was really bad because, so it was my first ever journalism job was mm -hmm. Grenfell. Mm -hmm. And I just can't read about it, but we, we, should, we should talk about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, what happened there is happening all over the country. People are still living in homes that are covered in cladding mm -hmm. and there are no rights. I mean, wh why did you put Grenfell in the book? Well, I did lots of reporting at the time um, in the immediate aftermath and then kept lots of relationships with people to kind of see how they were being housed and you know what kind of temporary accommodation they were living in so in the book I interview one resident who is in a holiday inn in Kensington for you know up to 
a year, two years, where she shares a single room with her mother. And I just thought all of those granular details about what it means to live in a hotel where the windows don't open and you don't have like the comforting jangle of your keys, you have a key card, you know, you don't have access to, you know, a washing machine, all those sorts of things just create this kind of the longevity of your psychological trauma, you know, and people are suspended in these states. And I just thought that there was lots to say about that, but also then following you know, following the story and seeing how tenants were treated like during the Grenfell inquiry was just so disgusting. Mm -hmm. And it showed you how much of a penalty there is for working class people trying to advocate for their own interests. You know, they're, you know, during the the inquiry, they had so many accusations leveled at them from being aggressive to loud to disruptive. And you think, okay, well, what is the palatable way to complain then if even that is being policed and you know, you're seeing it play out on a national and sometimes global scale. And, you know, you're you're not happy with how that's being resolved. Now, was that word being bandied about by some commentators? It just makes me feel quite sick. It was grateful that they should be grateful that they're in holiday inns, that they're in, you know, hotel rooms, that they're in other housing. It just... It just makes my skin crawl. Yeah, it's a complete misunderstanding of how important community is, Mm -hmm. you know. And it's also a complete misunderstanding of, like, you know, the complete fabric of neglect. So, you know, cladding has become a really big issue and a big conversation point when we talk about Grenfell because that has been something that has affected leaseholders across the country. But this is also a story about, you know, um, you know, self-closing fire doors, about staircases, about uh, emergency services and the way that we interact with the fire service, about sprinklers, about fire extinguishers. Mm. You know, these were all things that, you know, residents as part of the the Grenfell Action Group like those are all things that they were bringing up and they were talking about for years and years and years and so everything is connected and I think that you know the story really touched a nerve with so many people living in social housing because you know what it feels like Like I know what it feels like to go to the local housing association with my mum and do some translation and try and do the admin for her and then later on in my life when I enter the private rented market all of that admin knowledge is just kind of like shrugged off as not important. Mm. You know, it's like, oh, if you don't have a guarantor, then you actually don't know what you're talking about. Even though I've like, you know, written about a thousand complaint letters in my life and worked closely with the housing association. So that even like the way that you know admin is kind of policed and and fits into a kind of hierarchy. I really wanted to talk to you about guarantors (laughs) because it's wild, really, that you have to, even if you can prove that you can pay the rent every single month. You have to have someone else with a, a salary that is above the national average, mm-hmm. in the, sorry, the national median mm-hmm. of salaries in order to qualify. I mean, what kind of barriers is that? Such an obvious question. What kind of barriers is that put up? <laughs> well, Ava, <laughs> it creates various barriers. <laughs> I told you my line of questioning would be big. You'd be so disappointed. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's true that there's a class component that you feel at, at every point of the housing industrial complex. Mm. And working class people are demonised at every point. And that's everything from like how your taste is policed in terms of your interior design and the decisions you make to whether or not you have a guarantor, to, you know, the kind of like housing stock you've lived in before. You know, all of this stuff is tied up uh, with how you're then treated and discriminated against by landlords or estate agents, right? But we know that the profit motive of capitalism is built into, you know, the way that we think about the housing crisis. And it's such a good example. The guarantor is such a good example of that because it, it really creates this barrier before you've even walked in the door. So, you know, I write in the book about all of that kind of, you know, the, the, the weight of admin and how it stopped me from even accessing a place. And so, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I just wonder what that process is like for, you know, middle class people who have never had to scramble and never mm-hmm. had to kind of search wildly in their local community or their environment or people they know or parents of the, their housemates to ask them to be a guarantor. And I've done that and it creates a really weird social dynamic. You know, your power dynamic is really off if you're asking your mate's dad to be your guarantor. Yeah. But what I don't understand either because it doesn't apply to like anything else that you would you would buy. <laughs> but for some reason, there's that weird clause that someone else could be culpable for the entirety of your rent mm-hmm. if you don't if you don't pay it or you bail out or whatever. I mean, it just doesn't it it doesn't really make sense. I think a lot about when I so I, I 
did a year abroad in Chicago. Mm-hmm. So desperate to talk about my year abroad. <laughs> I'm glad I've talked about it. Um, and they have something called redlining. Well, they don't have it anymore, but they do have it unofficially. And redlining is when you have certain blocks of the city, which is basically white only. Mm-hmm. And they do that by pricing certain communities out of that area. And it's still really, really quite obvious that that's the you can you can tell from voting blocks you can tell from censuses um but i mean essentially we've got that here mm-hmm. but we've just got it on a on a class level because how how on earth would someone who isn't who's homeless how and they might, might be estranged from their family how would they go on to rent a property they physically can't and that brings us on to social housing mm-hmm. and how there isn't enough of that anymore you talk about that quite a lot yeah just, just one of the things I wanted to mention about redlining mm. as well is the way in which our urban environments are really designed to reflect that inequality as well. Mm. So, you know, in, in lots of areas of the US, you know, in redlined areas, there, you know, there isn't as much like access to green space and literally trees have not been planted in as high numbers in sort of black areas or Latinx areas as there are in white areas. And so they don't benefit from the transpiration cooling of, you know, of, of plants and trees. And so it literally means that those who are most in poverty, who are usually communities of colour, are simply hotter than everybody else. And so as we face down a climate emergency, certain people are just having like a hotter, worse, like more challenging time. And so I just think it's a good, it's a good way to say like, this is this is wrapped up in like what we might think of as abstract admin, but it's also really seen in like the way that houses are built, the way that our communities are mapped out for us. And social housing is a really good example of that because, you know, these are these are places that simply do not rank highly on the on the agenda when people are asking for better, when they're asking for what they're entitled to, and when they're saying we're not going to accept the terms that we've been given and and often they're forced to. But yeah, I mean I think that, you know, often the conversation about the housing crisis, you know, sort of feels like it could be neatly answered with house building. And of course, that's a huge component. But really, when we're talking about house building, we're talking about good quality housing stock at social rented cost and, you know, something to facilitate the fact that we have over a million people on waiting lists for social housing in this country. And so it's astonishing. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's crazy. It's such a it's such a mad figure to just drop in. Like just a million people waiting for a house. It's crazy. A million people waiting for a house, and seventeen and a half million people who don't have access to safe, secure, and stable housing. That's that's. I mean, it's it's you know, it's a huge portion of the population, and it's become so normalised because you know now almost everybody has a language to discuss the housing crisis, and you're like, wow, if it's not working for like, you know. Middle England, who's it working for? It's, it's not working for like middle class homeowners who like 10 years ago would be seen as being like the more stable, um, you know, stably housed members of society. Who is it working for? A very small portion of the population who are property owners or landowners. I think that's, I don't really think enough people perhaps in the generation above us understand that. Like my mum always talks about like when I was struggling for housing a few years ago, she was like, just go and put your name on the list because that's what she did. Right. And I'm like, no, it doesn't, it's not like that anymore. Mm. She's like, yes, it is. She's like, <laughs> just, it's fine. I'll just pay for half of it. Don't worry. And I'm like, no, 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 they really don't do it anymore. And I think what you were saying about the trees is so interesting because it's making me think about beautification mm-hmm. and sorry to bring it back to Grenfell, but that tragedy was born out of trying to make that building more attractive, more palatable for the wealthier people who live in that area. Mm-hmm. And that's the same when you're talking about different groups being pushed into certain areas and then not bothering to plant trees. It's, I mean, what is what is the reason behind that? It's like, is it to cater to a certain class or what is it? Yeah, I think it is to cater to a specific kind of class interests. Mm. And I think, you know, the, the book kind of talks about gentrified aesthetics and you know I really see gentrification as a housing issue first and foremost but like you know there's a bit where I I write about the estate that I grew up on and like how I was like loved purple dash and you know I kind of was like oh they're like crystals and you know and I just kind of love that aesthetic Mm. because of course you love your home and now in the researching of the book I was like oh actually the existence of pebble dash decreases the value of your home by five percent at least 
And so there is, you know, there are all these kind of demonized aesthetics, you know, that can decrease the value of your home on your street, on your neighborhood based on, you know, as kind of frivolous things as, you know, the way that your hedges look to the way that people's front doors look to like how well, well maintained your front garden or the color of your external houses. Really? So, yeah. So, you know, the, the kind of the idea of houses as commodities really holds up in this way, because when you see these things like through through assets only when you see homes through the lens of assets only you see how egregious and also how deep rooted the you know the profit motive of capitalism is like it lives in the walls it lives in the streets it lives in the paint color it lives in the existence of pebble dash they're bringing down the neighborhood with their bad hedges <laughs> yeah I don't actually... And also, I don't know about you if you're in a mutual aid group, but I am, which is kind of a, a hangover from that period of lockdown. And it very quickly turned into like policing pe- like people's like, hedges and, you know, policing the aesthetic of the streets, which was like something that obviously started out as like, you know, helping people with their shopping. I've got to be honest, I don't think I've ever lived on a street that had hedges. <laughs> like, do you know what a hedge is? <laughs> yeah, I've never seen a hedge. I'm trying to think. I think my nan has a hedge. <laughs> But I can't imagine that it's police because it right. looks a state. I'm thinking about it. It <laughs> looks awful. But yeah, I had a similar experience, which is why like, I'd also talk in the book about the kind of the cultural and physical shift of like moving from like an inner city place to the countryside mm. when I moved to Wales as a young person. Because, you know, the only green space that I was able to access was like, you know, the sort of 10 yards from my front door. And then suddenly seeing like, you know, that horizon open and seeing, you know, what what is out there for you like what is accessible and then wondering why there's not people that look like you who are accessing it mm. is really interesting and it also has historical roots you know in the way that obviously the victorians would go to the beach or they'd go to the countryside mm. to take the air yeah you know as respite from industrial smog of the period did you read that study in the times or it might have been the telegraph actually the other day and it was about how people who move from cities to suburbia get really depressed and there's like an uptick in medication that's prescribed and so it's kind of like you either go all or nothing you either go full city or you go countryside like barrett homes you just don't you don't do it (laughs) have you ever lived in suburbia i haven't but i've lived in like small villages and towns that have felt like uh, that kind of like a a middle space Mm. between the two you know and because they because they are physically isolated and i think that that's quite interesting because i think your body suddenly has to adjust from like urban noise to rural quiet and like, you know, all that that whole kind of sonic environment, sonic environment and how that affects your body and how it affects your visibility, I think is really interesting. And also the visibility of your, of your local community Mm. and yeah, how much that can become a microcosm of where you've come from. Yeah, I think that I think it's really interesting, and I try and get into it a little bit in the book, but obviously it's so. Yeah, sprawling. you you talk about like through the walls and like you know what you could hear when you were growing up and how that influences like who you are as a person. I didn't know that. So I probably should have known this and out myself. I didn't know that music producers come from houses where you can hear through the walls. I didn't realize that was a thing. Maybe. Yeah, like you know, so many people who live in like in council estates or in social housing know like you know how the thinness of a wall like facilitates sound moving in and out and you know those those are the first times that I ever heard like you know a bashburn or afrobeats or even gospel or whatever through the walls and I'm sure they were hearing like my mum play Mariah and Bollywood mm-hmm. Bollywood through our walls so you know Mariah and Bollywood <laughs> yeah, yeah right yeah. mashups yeah. yeah but like you know how you know how that like you know creates you know production ear or a sonic ear but it's also about like hearing your neighbors and like hearing house parties and you know hearing how you create something that feels protective and feels like respite from the outside world and I think that all of that's really important I remember like <laughs> we used to watch EastEnders and you could always hear like everybody just like playing like the duff duffs like a yeah. second out of time through the wall yeah everyone's watching the same episode but there is such a, a feeling of con- obvious connection that happens from that, which, you know, which is kind of much more real than the idea of us all like being best friends and like doing shopping for each other. And you know, some of that happened. That's what you mean by community. Yeah, it's just about the closeness and awareness of one another. And, you know, in, in the case of Grenfell, for instance, that ended up, you know, being so important in terms of the way that 
that was reported. You know, who, do you know who lives next door to you? Do you know their names? Do you mm. know how many children do you, do you know? And, you know, that that created a lot of like community harmony. But I think it's I think it's an Im- important point to make because, you know, the the way that the, the, the media at large has reported on working class spaces and working class homes has always been about antisocial behavior or sites of antisocial behavior. And when I was writing the book, you know, I, I visited various archives of noise complaints in relation to like social like social housing and council estates. And we know that part of gentrification is about noise complaints. Mm. And so it was all about this idea of like, oh, sound systems. Oh, let me get a racket. Oh. But it was like, well, people are finding rest time. Like Mariah again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's like, you know, people who like you know, aren't allowed in clubs because of racist door policies are then going into their homes and like having a house party and you can't even do that. That's really interesting. Mm. That Grenfell stuff you were just talking about as well, that was, the way that that played out in the media, I think that was really confusing for a lot of newsrooms that the people who lived in the tower weren't to sort of some sort of homogenous group who all acted in one certain way. And then there was this kind of like weird phase where where all these newsrooms start going we should profile people who lived inside Grenfell and look they're all different they're all different people <laughs> it's like yeah yeah it doesn't like they're not a monolith like yeah and lots of those tenants own their properties mm. so it's like the idea that like even being a homeowner can save you is a myth you know so there is this you know it becomes kind of like an like neatly packaged just like you know this is a social housing crisis and it is absolutely but People owned the places, you know, people believed that dream, you know, that that came from Thatcher's acquisition of social housing, that, you know, people did do that and it couldn't save them. So the idea that you buy the home that you've grown up with and you buy your way into a safe, secure home is a fallacy. Really sad what you said in the middle there. It's really sad. Um, I guess that leads into talking about Thatcher and the Right to Buy Housing Act. Mm that she introduced and it's often hailed as this sort of like moment that the working class I guess got put on the agenda and like were given some kind of agency and it was like the best thing to ever happen to Britain Mm -hmm. but the reality of that is is quite different because while some people were allowed to buy their homes my my nan actually benefited from this she bought her home in South London Mm -hmm. but that that housing stock was never replaced. Mm. And I mean, another simple question for you, what does that mean? (laughs) (laughs) Well, it means that the government relies on landlords to pick up a housing deficit. Mm. And that is part of the reason why they're able to just name their price. And we're seeing such a a huge increase in, you know, people just raising rents and people being evicted. But you're right that, yeah, Thatcher's 1980 Housing Act is usually thought of as a year zero for this. And while I would say every like <laughs> every facet of the current housing crisis we feel can be traced directly back to that moment, mm. of course, this was a labour policy before then. So, you know, this, this kind of British obsession with home ownership has long roots and long history in this country, thanks to our colonial history, thanks to, you know, our obsession with aristocracy and land ownership. And so this has always been a discussion. This has always kind of been happening and bubbling under the surface about how we think of power, how we think of wealth and how home ownership is braided into that. And so Thatcher was just a continuation of this, but she was so aggressive with how the policy was um, kind of consumed and and how that pollinated through working class communities. Mm. But now, of course, we have this huge deficit and, yeah, government instead of doing subs- like substantial house building like they should have been doing for the last 10, 20 years, rely on landlords to fill the gap and landlords we know have exploited that. Yeah, and are suffering now because as inflation continues and the Bank of England keep putting up mortgage rates, absolutely, they are suffering. Well, they're not suffering. They're passing that cost on to their tenants. I mean, I think it's like a really odd time to be renting not to Mm -hmm. there'll be a lot of people like listening to this who'll be like yeah obviously but there's also (laughs) like another generation who perhaps haven't experienced it Mm. and I think like for me I find I've just sort of felt at sea recently Mm. like I just feel like I'm not going to attain some kind of permanence Mm -hmm. if that makes sense Mm -hmm. like I just sort of I've just signed funnily yesterday another tenancy for 12 months and the estate agent who's actually oddly really lovely 
was like, oh, I'm really sorry. I can't guarantee it after 12 months to you. It will probably go, you know, it will need to go. Mm-hmm. And I was just thinking about it this morning, like, so weird how your life kind of becomes mapped out in yearly cycles because you don't have, you, you're, you're just sort of, well, you, you're you're looking after the landlord really, aren't you, doing his wishes? Well, how that, that kind of temporal reality has become so normalised as well, right? Mm. So, you know, it's really unusual to think about re- long-term rental properties, like renting for like 5, 10, 15 years, because for our generation... Our generation? Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> for our generation, <laughs> like, that's so unusual. Like, it's almost unheard of. I don't know any of my peers who have been able to rent in the same place for over 10 years. Yeah. And, you know, so it's not... It doesn't even factor in. It doesn't even factor in that this might be a possibility. And so... It, you know, suddenly when those barriers to what is possible are put down straight away, you start thinking in these short-term ways as well. And so we know there's a crisis of private rented accommodation. We know that we need to think about good long-term solutions. We know we need to think about how rent is going to be regulated. We know that we need to look at what Scotland are doing with rent pressure zones and say, okay, is there, any, is there any part of this that we can adopt? We know that we come from a history of working class housing movements, which have been all about rent caps and rent regulation. Mm. And we know that like a rent cap is not some kind of like lefty, like harebrained scheme. They existed like up until the 80s in a very recent history. And so, you know, this this idea that like, oh, it's too mad to even think about it would never work. I think you know, it sometimes becomes the like the dominant response to this, but we really need to look back in the archive and say, what can we bring forward? What can we imagine better? How can we look at the, these like hardcore solutions about rent regulation, about caps, about good quality, long-term private accommodation, about affordable housing, social rented housing, and really employ it. And then once we're there, we can start having new conversations about everything else yeah it sounds it's always maddening to me when anyone talks about rent caps being unworkable you know you know rent regulation right. being unfeasible because i think it's easier maybe to just do a th- you know say a throwaway comment like oh it won't work when you are in a in a permanent house you know it's much easier to cast aspersions and say oh no when you're 24 25 you're meant to be moving around a little bit and it's like no i'm talking about people who are like 35 36 yeah you know yeah yeah and and that impacts your life decisions. You know, for a lot of people, it, you know, it impacts, you know, what the rest of your life looks like, whether that's like, you know, family in the traditional sense, whether that's like travel, whether that's being able to, uh, you know, move into different careers. You know, all of these things are connected. Yeah. You know, and before we even start thinking about health. But it's also that, you know, even if we are talking about like this mythical like group of 20s who are supposed to be moving around and having a fun fab time, it's like, yeah, but the conditions you're living in are terrible. Maybe you don't have a living room. Maybe you are like huffing mold and being told that it's your own fault because you dry your clothes in the house. And maddening. <laughs> so maddening. You know, like, and maybe and you feel like you have no agency to have a stake in your community because you have to move all the time. Mm. And, you know, and then you have to come up against these very kind of um, sort of stressed identifiers of the state. You know, you're the person that works at your local council or your local housing association, who is also, you know, part of a mental health crisis of being very low resourced, of being very highly stressed and having to deal with a huge workload of people. So it's like, you know, all all of these things like affect every element of it. And then even home ownership is not promised. You know, home ownership, home ownership even once it's acquired, through the lens of this luxury commodity, does not grant us a stability when we live in a country who are experiencing the most egregious wage freezes since the Napoleonic Wars. You know, we are we are in a crisis of our labour market, and to to talk about that separately from housing is crazy. And then it's wild when we have a discussion about why aren't millennials having children? Mm-hmm. All of the reasons that you've just laid out, I'm sure, factor in. It's not just a new generation of like, you know, liberal people who don't feel they need to have children. It's actually just not being able to accommodate a child. I mean, I I think that the sort of transience that we're experiencing at the moment, if I was the sort of person who wanted to have children, would I want to do it in a rented property when I don't know if I'm going to be able to be there in four months time? Mm -hmm. No, probably not. Yeah. And this is even, you know, this is talking about like 
you know, the nuclear family or, or you know, mm. heteronormative couples who, you know, traditionally, historically and in our present have like an easier time of things than, you know, queer communities or trans couples who mm. historically might have used social housing or might have used like a squatting framework in order to live and, you know, build a community. And those things don't exist in the same way either. So again, you know, those who maybe you know have a little bit more um like privilege or like have more fixed material conditions to be able to do those things are struggling and having a really difficult time and we know that that's just ampli amplified and much worse for people who live on you know who are marginalized communities or are living in like temporary accommodation you know in the book i interview you know a girl who's living in a shipping container mm. in west london and you just think well this is not a place that can facilitate decisions about your immediate future but that is the solution that Ealing Council have given you. Well let's talk about conditions of housing so you talk about living in two different houses where you had black mold there might be more sorry I've only I've only written two down <laughs> you talk about Amersham Grove and you talk about Peeps Road and New Cross yeah and houses that have active black mold spores growing in the house yeah and nothing you can do about that you just have to accept it yeah i'm being completely demonized by both the estate agent and the landlord as you know as we know was happening to lots of people across the country as being you know a lifestyle choice well mm, don't dry your clothes in the house oh well you know what you're doing what you're doing what you're doing where are you going to dry them i mean for people outside of cities like yeah i don't want to shock everyone but like you actually don't normally have outdoor space hair dryer yeah <laughs> yeah a hair dryer in the yeah. economy like i don't even <laughs> dry my own hair <laughs> <laughs> Like, um, so yeah, I you know I, I certainly lived under those conditions, and I really felt like you know the difficulty of trying to get a response from the powers that be. Um, but also, it really you know that chapter really talks about how this is knitted into our personal health and our ability to advocate for it. Mm. And I talk about how difficult that is when you have a GP and you're constantly moving around, and then you have to change GP from you know every time that you move. And um, I kind of scammed mine by just remembering my postcode and saying I was with the same That's one. That's what I found. Year. You know, they take you off if you don't use it. Yes. I found this out. Yes. I, I rang up and they were like, no, 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 you, you haven't needed us in a while. So we just took you off the book. So I was like, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not advocating scamming the NHS, but I am just saying that, you know, these are the these are the ways that people have to find solutions. Mm. Because when I was able to do that, because luckily I was moving around to various places in the same borough, it really helped like my chest infections to be able to see the same person over and over and you know not everybody has access to that but what i'll say about the the mold chapter is that i was able to speak to lots of mold activists in the space which is really which is you know it's so interesting because it really told me a story about how you can push back and how there are ways to resist beyond uh residents associations and tenants unions which i think are really important but we know that we, you know, we have the oldest housing stock in Europe, right? We know that the cost of that is huge. We know that that's not being retrofitted. We know that nothing is really being done in a real way about that. And there are two examples that I thought were, were just amazing. And one was about the history of damp tapes from the 1970s, where uh, a piece of equipment called a porter pack, which was basically a, a really big like, wieldy camera, uh, was given to filmmakers and they took them to squats because they lived in squats. And they used them to film the damp that, that they lived within. And then, you know, three or four people like were carrying the camera and then they would go down to the housing association and play the damp tapes to kind of embarrass the local housing association into doing something about it. Quite hot. But it acted, yeah. But it acted as like evidence. And, you know, that has continued, you know, people filming, you know, people like Quajo making mm. visible these things that have become invisible, or haven't had a mainstream audience. And that, that has really continued and you know now that archives exist online but people are doing that all the time um and yeah i think that there's like a lot that we can learn about how we document and resist and another one was um an artist that i spoke to and she uh creates these diy spore traps which lots of housing activists use which is where you have a petri dish and you mix it with like malt dextrin and agar agar 
and you leave it open, which I did in my house as some citizen science. And then it captures like a spore and you leave it open for two hours and then you close it and then the the spores start germinating. And if you if there's the existence of black mold in your home, then it will come up in your petri dish. So you can kind of use that as well as evidence, maybe just for yourself and then possibly for your landlord to say, no, no, there is Strachybotterus or black mold in my house. Mm. And so all of these small ways of kind of coalescing and saying okay there's there's ways to push back there's ways to you know document a skeptical landlords to getting my voice heard and that's not to say that everybody should start making diy spore traps and that will save us all mm. but it is to say that there is movement and urgency and responses happening all the time you know and people finding new ways and i think that you know, if that's your way in and then you take that knowledge to your tenants union and then you take that knowledge together, create a coalition to your estate agent or your landlord when you have 34 people doing phone banking or whatever, you know, maybe you can move things in the right direction or you can see some real change. But yeah, this is this has always happened. And, you know, there are certain communities that are like more easily ignored than others, which we saw in the, you know, a shark case, which was, you know, obviously when... um the case of a young boy who died thanks to the existence of mold mm. in his home and his parents had been you know uh, ha- had been complaining about this issue for a very long time and been ignored and so we know that this isn't just about complaints being ignored it's about certain communities having their complaints ig- ignored more frequently and that having devastating and and murderous consequences it kind of reminds me of like, so we actually interviewed someone last year who had successfully taken their landlord to court mm-hmm. and he had um, managed to recoup all of his rent that he'd paid the landlord mm-hmm. because the house was in such a state of disre- disrepair. It was a white man. And I think that speaks into what you're saying that like, yes, certain communities are able to, I mean, the the reality of like most people taking the landlord to court, that terrifies me I don't think I can't imagine I mean these young parents would they have done that how would they have known that they can do that Mm -hmm. I think that maybe you're maybe you're right we need to start going back to like the turn of the 20th century idea of like you know going to you you know like the workers movement when like one person would go to university and they'd come back and they'd be like this is what I've learned and like spread it all amongst we've got to do that with housing yeah, absolutely. And but it's also I think it's just about saying, look, this is the reality of the Britain that we live in. This is how we live. Yes, there's a crisis of home ownership. Yes, there's a crisis of private rented accommodation, but the crises are are so sprawling and so connective. They're so racialized. Mm-hmm. They, you know, they are murderous. They, you know, they are a conversation about immigration, about health, about green space, about you know, workers' movements, about strike action, you know, all of these things are connected. Housing, to me, is the thing that everything else orbits around. But that is not the prominence in which government has treated it, you know. And this and the turnover, the frequent turnover of our housing ministers really speaks to the idea that this is not given due prominence. And so I think that while things like the Renters Reform Bill go some way to answering some of these questions, of course, it's, you know, the abolition of Section 21, no fault evictions, for instance, is obviously a move in the right direction. There's there's, su- there's such a litany of things that don't even factor in, which are so urgent and we need to think about and talk about mm-hmm. now. But you're... Yeah, go ahead. Well, no, I was going to say, how do you tell communities about that? Like, how do do people know about, you know, Section 21? Do they know what that is? Do they, If you were... I don't know, if you're quite new to the country mm. and it's not your first language and you get a letter through your door saying you've got to move out, you're not going to go, well, wow, there's actually the rent reform bill and I can stay. Of course. Like, and also, like, <laughs> housing policy is a notoriously complicated part of law. Like, I, you know, I've been writing and researching this book over two years and then before then, like, writing about housing and home for, like, 10 years, I'm not an expert. It's so complicated and it, and it changes frequently. And that's by design. You know, and that's why I think like learning kind of admin and, and creating community groups through tenants unions are really great. But you're absolutely right. You know, a lot of these people, a lot of people, a lot of tenants in this country, including myself, and I talk about this, is is like learning the reality of our housing system by experiencing it firsthand. Mm. So I remember I reported in 2016 about um, 
a, a property developer and landlord, Fergus Wilson, who point blank refused to rent his properties to South Asian tenants and then actually to any to single mums and then to tenants in receipt of housing benefit. And that was the first time which I I, I was like, wait, is this allowed? Can people do this? Wait, mm. can people do this? And then the reporting of that, I, you know, I, I realised that there are landlords all over the country who are acting on this kind of d- discrimination. And so it's stuff that we suspect, you know, of, of course, like, you know, some of the most egregious uh, like structural discrimination, structural racism finds its way into our housing system. Mm. But what is written in policy to protect tenants? What is written in, in policy to, you know, protect white middle class tenants as much as, you know, tenants of colour or trans tenants or whatever? You know, there's there's barriers created for you all the time. And a lot of them you only know when you've experienced them firsthand and you come up against them very closely. And then you're looking around like, do, do we all know that this is happening? And that's why like part of the book is really it's just aiming to say this this is the reality of how we live. This is people are living in this way. I've lived in this way. And I've noticed like all of the beautiful details of home from like net curtains to pebble dash and like I've got discourse to make about magnolia walls. Mm. But ultimately this is about like the fact that people are living in temporary accommodation, they're living in places not fit for human habitation. And people are resisting, but really we have to understand the issues at large in order to resist together in a meaningful way. Your your description of living on Green Man Lane reminded me so much of, li- of like being at my nan's when I was younger. She was in South London. And it's just like those little details that I guess I hadn't even thought about since. And you were talking about the tissue box. And then I was just thinking about my nan's neck curtains and she's from Italy and she's got all these like sort of ornate little actually just like a lot of knickknacks that are china and but they're they came from italy you know and like i have i guess like you know remakes of them right like the cheap remake right whatever (laughs) no i was thinking like i forgot all about them yeah so the first chapter really talks about our relationships with objects Mm. and i interviewed like various psychologists about this and they make a distinction with the objects in our home between personal objects and linking objects and so they would say a personal object is something like so you go to like Alton Towers and you have a wicked time on Nemesis and then you buy a magnet and you put it on your fridge and every time you look at the magnet on your fridge, it reminds you of that day in Alton Towers. And that's distinguished from a linking object, which is like in South Asian communities, like it might be a fake plastic tissue box or like something from your nan's house. Mm. And every time you see it, it, it reminds you of a, an ancestral place or a more abstract memory. So it's not necessarily the, the, you know, the cold day in the market that you bought it, that you're remembering every time you look at it. You're remembering something else, something more connected to history, nostalgia, heritage and home. And so, you know, the reverence for the small things that we bring with us is really important because that's how we can build home in a crisis which forces us to move all the time. Mm. There's so much I want to talk to you about, but I've, I, th- I fear we've gone on too long. So I'll just say, yeah. I think you should... If you're listening to this, you should buy the book. It's called All the Houses I've Ever Lived In, and it's Kieran Yates. And join your local renters' union. Join your local renters' union, yeah. (laughs) Cool. Thank you.